Hello everybody, it's Dr. Gymnatus again from Cardiovascular Interventions in Orlando. And today, I'm going to talk about a very important subject. A subject that has really intrigued me since I was a fellow, and it's all about prevention again. But the question is, what is it that's causing the inflammation in the arteries? So when I was a fellow, I used to ask my professors that, and never really got a straight answer. And today, uh, after doing extensive work and research and experience in 35 years in this field, I wish to share some of what I've learned with you all. And in my previous lectures, we talked about the role of the endocrine system. So we talked about hyperinsulinemia. We talked about uh, uh, the hormonal changes that result in metabolic syndrome. So remember, metabolic syndrome is high sugar, high blood pressure, increased weight, low HDL, uh, and, uh, and increased abdominal girth with a lot of fat around the abdomen. And this leads to atherosclerosis. So as a result, we talked about the dietary changes. We talked about the benefits of intermittent fasting, uh, time-restricted feeding, and we talked about how to eliminate all processed foods and refined products and mostly sugar. And I've been doing this now for many years, and I've seen drastic, dramatic responses in the office. But I didn't fully understand the mechanism. So today I want to share something new with you, which I think is very important. That the upper part of the intestine deals with the calories that are absorbed into the body, the nutrients that are absorbed into the body. And then the colon, down further down, was really felt to be just a depository of all the fiber. And as I did more and more research, I found out that actually, why, why would we have such a large colon full of fiber and undigested matter? And I found out that it's not. There's actually a ton of bacteria in there. Bacteria. So there's probably about 80 trillion bacteria in your colon. And there's 10 trillion cells in your body. So the question is, what are the bacteria doing there in the gut? Did they just happen to come there? Why are they there in the first place? How did they get there? And if they're in there, how come they're not getting into your bloodstream? And if they do get into your bloodstream, are you going to get sick? Or maybe a little bit of it is getting into your bloodstream and making you sick and causing atherosclerosis and metabolic syndrome. Could this be a problem? Could this be an answer? Do the gut bacteria have only one type? Why are there many types of bacteria in the gut? There's also viruses, by the way. There's probably about 30, 380 trillion viruses in there. And of course, there's some fungi as well over there. So what are they doing over there? And when I'm telling my patients, all of you, to change your diet, stop eating so frequently, stop eating processed foods, and start eating whole foods, well, what am I really doing to the bacteria down there? And maybe some of these benefits are because of the bacterial changes rather than just the hormonal changes occurring higher up with the absorption because the fiber, as we know, decreases the absorption of sugar, so you get less of an insulin spike. And because you get less insulin spike, you're not going to get insulin resistance. If you don't get insulin resistance, you're not going to get a fatty liver, you're going to lose weight, and you're going to feel better. And we've seen these results. But I think there's more to it than meets the eye. So the question is, what are the bacteria doing there? And what kinds of bacteria are there? And how many different varieties are there? And how is my bacteria different from an un unhealthy person or an obese person or someone with metabolic syndrome or someone with chronic inflammatory bowel disease or autoimmune diseases? And I started doing more and more research. So this is going to be the first of many, many videos that I'm going to put out. And to show you that when you are making these changes that I've been recommending to you all, you're actually not just affecting your hormones, you're actually drastically changing the entire metabolism in the body. So by the time the, the food gets down to the colon, you're really left with the undigested complex carbohydrates and fiber. And we've always heard that fiber is good for you, but nobody really knew why. I mean, it's just because it gives you a big poop. I mean, so what do you have a big poop? How does that make you live longer? How does that lower your blood pressure? How does that decrease your chances of developing metabolic syndrome? We really do not know the full answers, but it is the fiber that is feeding the bacteria that's one part of the story. That when you eat a meal that is full of natural fiber and different kinds of fiber, then that's the food for the bacteria in your gut. 
And then the bacteria in turn must be doing something for you. So if it's a commensal relationship, it's in there, it's not going to harm you, it's not going to do you uh, harm unless it gets into your bloodstream. How does it stay inside? What products are the bacteria producing? We'll go over all this in my future videos in great detail. But today, I want to tell you why this is important. The gut bacteria, we know produce substances. We know that. That help the gut uh, lining so that the gut lining is healthier. We know it affects the immune system because your immune system is keeping the bacteria there and letting the food come in. So we know that it's affecting your immunity. And I told you that heart disease is an inflammatory condition. Coronary artery disease is inflammatory. Congestive heart failure, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, these are all inflammatory conditions and they're associated with metabolic syndrome and fatty liver and all the inflammatory markers are really, really high. So we know there's inflammation going on. So we know that there's a multitude of factors that are going on in your gut and let's try to explore them. So what's the mechanism? What is it that I'm really after? I want to see why. Why is it that some patients are losing weight, but they're still sick and they're inflamed? So they've lost their weight. The insulin levels have come down. And they're still sick. They still have inflammation. They may have inflammatory bowel disease. They may have joint problems. They may have mental fog. They may still have high blood pressure. They're still getting progressive atherosclerosis. They're getting more and more coronary artery disease. So, when we look at the mechanism, there's a thing called lipopolysaccharides that have really intrigued me. And lipopolysaccharides are the bacterial wall linings. So, the lining of all the bacteria, the walls of them, they, they call lipopolysaccharides. And I'm going to call them LPS for short. So, we have now shown that when patients have lipopolysaccharides in the bloodstream, then that causes inflammation. The lipopolysaccharides then circulate around the body. Of course, first and foremost, they go to the liver. And when they go to the liver, they cause inflammation in the liver. And they cause fatty liver changes. Which brings me to my observation myself that I have seen patients who brought the insulin levels down, who've lost weight, but they still have a fatty liver. I have seen patients who've got severe coronary calcification and they do not have diabetes, yet they have a very fatty liver. And they don't have alcohol. They don't have chronic liver disease uh, like hepatitis B or hepatitis C, but they have a fatty liver. And all of a sudden, the light bulbs go off that this fatty liver is possibly caused by the inflammation that's coming from the gut. And it's these lipopolysaccharides that are supposed to stay in the gut, are getting into the bloodstream and getting into the liver, and then in the liver, creating the fatty liver. And then, of course, it moves on to the rest of the body. In the liver, it'll also cause insulin resistance. So the lipopolysaccharides cause insulin resistance at the level of the muscles and at the, at the level of the liver. So now things are beginning to kind of make more sense that if you have lipopolysaccharides leaching into the bloodstream, going to the muscles, causing insulin resistance at the level of the muscles, all right? In the liver, it's causing the fatty liver, also causing insulin resistance and inflammation. Interleukin-6 levels go up tumor necrosis factors go up, and a low-grade inflammation starts because those bug coatings are not supposed to be in the bloodstream. So then these, these lipopolysaccharides also get into the brain. And we know that the blood-brain barrier is supposed to keep all these things out. But there's evidence to show that when lipopolysaccharides get to the brain, they can actually breach that and they can actually get into the brain and cause inflammation. And when they cause inflammation in the brain, uh, in the astrocytes and, and, and the cells that are in the brain, you can actually see that on CT scan showing small vessel disease. And this has intrigued me because these patients that come to me with, with metabolic syndrome, coronary artery disease, I do a CT of the head because oftentimes they have depression. And the only thing that comes like positive is evidence of small vessel disease. And then when you ask my neurology friends, what does all that mean? There's no real answer. So, wait a second. So you're getting small vessel disease in the brain. These patients have the phenotype of depression. Well, 
when, when, when in the animal models in, in mammals particularly when they when they're sick they have the sickness syndrome the sickness syndrome means they get withdrawn they don't want to interact socially they just want to stay on their own that's that's nature's protective mechanism that hey listen you you sick you need to heal so you need to kind of isolate yourself so could this be a protective mechanism that is built into us that if you have lipopolysaccharides getting into your bloodstream, in turn, your, your, it's going to affect your brain and cause depression. Now, look around. Depression goes hand in hand with coronary artery disease. I've said that in all my talks. There's a 400% increased incidence of depression when you have uh, coronary artery disease also. So this is a systemic disease. This LPS is causing a systemic problem. In the brain, is causing mental fog, small vessel disease, depression, um, uh, and then in the liver, it's causing the fatty liver, as I said. In the muscle, it's causing insulin resistance. And at the, at the level of um, the hormones, it causes insulin resistance, more weight gain as well. These lipopolysaccharides also affect your immunocytes. So your immune system gets stimulated. So when your immune system gets stimulated, now you're going to get all the inflammatory markers going up in your body. Okay? And... We've, we've seen this with coronary artery disease. We see this with, uh, with uh, the, the problems in the, in the metabolic patients. So lipopolysaccharides, why would they cross into the bloodstream? And why is it that a lot of my patients are getting better with diet? And I think it's because when you're eating the fiber, so there's many factors, but when you're eating the fiber, you're fueling the right type of bacteria in your gut. So the right bacterial species and strains grow, and they in turn have a beneficial effect to us because they heal the intestinal lining. And we'll go into this in great detail in my detailed talks, but there's things called short-chain fatty acids that are produced by the bacteria, which in turn help to heal the gut lining and prevent this uh, leakiness of the uh, intestinal lining so that the lipopolysaccharides don't leach into your bloodstream. And there's lots of mechanisms. I'll go over that in great detail with all of you in my future talk as well. But to know for a practical purpose that eating the right kinds of whole foods are of benefit to you, not just because, oh, yeah, I'm getting the fiber and therefore I'm attenuating my insulin response. It's also because you're feeding the bacteria. You're eating not for yourselves. You're eating for yourselves and your bacteria. So then that, that brings me to another question. What else do these bacteria want besides different types of fiber? And by the way, it needs a variety of fiber, not just one kind. You know? So you want to eat a variety of different, different uh, fiber sources. But the other thing are phytonutrients. Now, these phytonutrients, are, you know, the flavonoids and all the different colorings that we see in foods that we know are beneficial, are actually not for us. They're for, for our bacteria because they foster the growth of the right kinds of bacteria in your gut and a, and a good variety of bacteria. It's not just one kind. There's well over 2,000 different species of bacteria in your gut, and you want them all because they keep them all in balance. And, and that's what results in a healthy um, you know, gut, gut lining. So they want the right foods. They want to eat the fiber. They want to eat the phyto, phytonutrients as well. And then the other thing is that we need to make sure that we're not destroying that population down there. And in a separate video, I'm going to show you how the sweetness that you are eating, the antibiotics that you are taking, and the antibiotics that are in all your foods that's contaminated are actually destroying the bacterial flora in your gut. So if you have a gut flora that's been demolished or the variety and the diversity has been demolished by your lifestyle, your eating, your antibiotics and your sweetness and chemicals and toxins that you put in your food, then you can now see a picture that, well, my gut bacteria flora diversity is gone. They're not producing the right substances for me to heal my gut. I'm developing a leaky gut and that's causing the endotoxins lipopolysaccharides. Another word for them is endotoxins. And they get into the bloodstream. And I call this metabolic endotoxemia. Endotoxemia, that means toxicity in your bloodstream. Coming from what? Bacterial products that should not be in the bloodstream. So these bacterial varieties that we have in our gut, it's very complicated. 
from everything I've been reading, it's not just the species because different species can then also change what they produce. And therefore, the ultimate effect is going to be what chemicals are those bacteria making that are making your gut better, not just the species. So we can identify the species, um, but it's also the products that they are making that's important. So it was very interesting studies on this, and I'm just going to tickle you with a little bit of it right now because we're going to go through it in a separate video, is that you can take a stool sample and look at it and you can predict obesity. So there is a microbiome, a microbiome meaning the total population of bacteria in your gut that identifies obesity. And what that really means is that those types of bacteria are more able to break down the carbohydrates and absorb more calories, number one. Hmm? Number two, they cause metabolic changes in your body. So they cause metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome in itself with hyperinsulinemia will make you gain weight as well. So just to tickle you a little bit further, if you take that microbiome and you transfer it into a, a, a lean person, uh, that lean person can become obese. And those studies have been done, both in rats and we also see them in human beings. Um, so fecal transplants are not something um, uh, that new. Uh, they are now actually giving us a lot of insight into how our microbiome is actually changing our metabolism, uh, metabolic syndrome, inflammation, and ultimately, I want. what do I want? I want to see that metabolic syndrome is, is out of the picture for my cardiac patients because that's what's driving coronary artery disease. So being a cardiologist, my particular interest in lipoproteins, uh, lipopolysaccharides, uh, uh, go even beyond what I've just told you. You know about cholesterol, right? The LDL. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the LDL. The LDL that I am very aggressive about is small dense LDL. So in the advanced lipid panel, why do I look at small dense LDL? It's because when these lipopolysaccharides get into the bloodstream, they cannot just flow free float in the bloodstream. So they are swiped up by immunocytes, of course, but one of the things that they are swiped up by are lipopolysaccharides, uh, sorry, lipoproteins. These lipoproteins is LDL but the LDL doesn't have a room on it. So it has to displace the cholesterol, and then the lipopolysaccharide takes its place and now has created a small, dense LDL particle. We know that it is the small, dense particles that cause atherosclerosis because they can get easily oxidized. They're taken up by the macrophages, and then they get foam cells. They can actually get into the endothelium of your blood vessels and cause atherosclerosis. So it is the lipopolysaccharides that are, that are taken up by the LDL, creating small, dense LDL, which then in turn are recognized by your immune system, swept up, creating foam cells. They also get stuck to the endothelium of your blood vessels and cause atherosclerosis. So why is this so important? Because I have seen that when my patient's LDL levels gross levels are fine, but they're still getting progressive disease. So then I order the advanced lipid panel and I see small, dense particles. If I simply went with the total LDL, I would have said, oh, everything is fine and hunky-dory, but the patient keeps coming back with more disease. Small, dense LDL, almost invariably associated with a fatty liver, which is almost invariably, unless you have hyperinsulinemia or other reasons to have a fatty liver, associated with a gut problem. And you have either due to dysbiosis, the term that I will use over and over again in my future lectures with you, because this is the first intro, but dysbiosis, wrong bacteria in your gut, leaky gut, a dysfunctional gut lining, a lining that is just not working well, not only because of the bacterial products, but there's other things that we are doing that are destroying our gut lining. Even stress destroys your gut lining. So I know I'm going all over the place here, but look at this. You know that when you're stressed out, you feel it in your gut, and your gut grumbles, you may get some diarrhea, you may get even abdominal pain, and all these things. Studies have been shown that this stress increases the lipopolysaccharide circulation in your bloodstream. How did that happen? One bad examination, one bad interview, and you're getting lipopolysaccharides into your bloodstream. 
It's because there's a big connection between the brain and the gut lining. Because ultimately, look, the gut lining is what's determining the outside world from you, yourself. So there has to be a big connection to the brain, and it's through the vagus nerve, which is the largest nerve in the body. So what happens is that this excessive stress in your brain works both ways. Your brain should know what's going on in the gut, but the gut also sends signal to the brain, vice versa. So what happens when you are stressed out? Your vagus nerve pours out, goes to the gut, and there it releases cortical, uh, uh, cortisol-releasing hormone, which then goes to the immunocytes in your gut and 70% of the immunocytes in your gut and causes release of some peptides from mast cells and other cells, which then destroy the lining, the porosity of the, of the gut lining increases. So your gut lining becomes leaky. Now, this is really scary. That means one episode of severe stress can cause leakiness of your gut for hours. And this has been shown, shown in studies. So... There are many factors, the bacteria crossing over, leaking of, leaking of the gut, inflammation. It all seems to start with having a healthy lining. So you need to have a healthy lining, healthy bacteria, and then deal with the problems that these are all creating in the body. From the practical standpoint, right, from the practical standpoint, we've already made the inroads in this. We talked about eating the right kinds of foods. We talked about exercise, exercise. Exercise is very healthy for you. And we know that one of the reasons is it actually helps the gut bacteria in your gut lining. Sleep, bad sleep, bad circadian patterns affect the gut lining as well. It affects the porosity of the gut lining. This is an intimate connection between all these lifestyle factors, which we will go over in great detail. Each lecture that I'm going to do thereafter from now onward. It's going to be about half an hour long and we'll deep dive into each one of these factors. How does sleep affect your gut bacteria and its lining, for example? How stress does it itself? Is and how that affects everything? Um, and of course, all the dietary things that I've already talked about and whether you can actually change your bacteria and eating fermented foods, for example, um, is that helpful? Are probiotics more helpful than fermented foods? Well, I'll tell you right now, it's the fermented foods. Uh, probiotics can be helpful in some cases. Um, so, and then we'll talk about gastric bypass surgery and how those patients are amazing because they have a complete transformation of their gut bacteria. And that's what's causing the sudden reduction in their weight, metabolism gets better, complete reversal of type 2 diabetes, complete reversal of type 2 diabetes. Inflammatory markers all go down. Fatty liver also gets better. So these entire changes are occurring. You know, we think that it's always oh, gastric bypass. It's all to do with the bacteria. So I'm tickling you all with the idea that it's really coming down to this. And some people will say, well, a small amount of lipopolysaccharides get into the bloodstream anyway. Well, I think that's, that's appropriate. That is, after every meal, you're going to get a little bit of lipopolysaccharides getting into the bloodstream inevitably because it's not 100% um, uh, intestinal closure to, uh, to the products. So you're going to get some. But that's how the body samples immunologically uh, what is good, what's bad, what, is, what shouldn't be treated, what should be treated. So a little bit of LPS getting into the bloodstream has now been felt to be normal, but it's that pathological one that comes across and when too much of it comes and too often. And maybe that's why my fasting is working so well with these patients. How come they're mentally also feeling better? How come the fatty liver is getting better with fasting? Because you're not getting that frequent LPS getting into the bloodstream. Every few hours, LPS getting into your bloodstream, causing inflammation. Because we talked about the frequent increase in insulin. Now I'm talking about the frequent increase in LPS getting into your bloodstream as well, causing a chronic low-grade inflammation in the bloodstream, the metabolic endotoxemia, as I was saying before. And then when you have insulin resistance, that compounds the problem. Because one of the issues that insulin is supposed to do is it dampens the immune response to this low-grade LPS. But when you have constantly high insulin levels, you're not going to be able to dampen this response. So I think that there's so many exciting things here that I want to talk about. 
um, from the practical standpoint for all of you, because you're watching this channel, you have already probably implemented the dietary changes, which is stay away from processed foods. Do not eat artificial foods or foods that have chemicals in them that you, don't, you can't even spell them. You don't even know what they are. If you, if you can't pronounce that word in that food label, and first of all, if it even has a food label, it's suspicious. And you've already made those changes. Do not eat it because it's not just affecting you. Much of your changes that are happening are because of the bacteria. Don't forget now, you're a symbiotic relationship with your bacteria. It's not just what you're eating. But almost 50% of the micronutrients in the body are probably produced by the bacteria and then liberated into you. Me meaning that your 21,000 genes are not enough to explain the complex physiology of the human being. But actually, you probably have another 4 million genes which belong to the bacteria that are actually doing the outsourced job for you. They are the ones who can constantly change as well their genome because the half-life of bacteria or the turnover is only less than hours, in some cases, at most a few days. So it can adapt. The genome of the bacteria in your gut can adapt to what you're eating. That is, this is amazing. And that's why we have such a variety of bacteria in our gut because then they can adjust to what you're eating. I think we just didn't realize this. So that is why you want the widest variety of bacteria in your gut, and thereby they keep themselves in balance, and they can handle anything that's coming their way, because their genome can adapt quickly. So let's be more mindful about what's going on in the gut. So as a cardiologist, you know, I just want to stop this inflammatory cascade that keeps happening. And yes, we've started the diet and we started the fasting. And if you still have a problem, it's probably with the gut. And there may be other issues that we can fine tune. And that's what these lectures will go over. How do you fine tune them? Maybe, maybe it's the leakiness. Maybe it's an allergy to certain types of food. Maybe it's SIBO, which is small uh, intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And you may need special treatment for that. Um, Maybe it's, you need a repopulation and that, of your bacteria, and I'm telling you that's coming down the road. We're already doing that for Clostridium difficile infections where we do the transplant of fecal materials uh, with, with, with very, very good success rates. So I think that stay tuned on this. We will go into each one in detail. And for those, I'll actually show you some slides and things so you can remember them and make it memorable. But this is my intro to my next series, which is going to be about inflammation from the bugs in your gut. So stay tuned. I hope that made you excited about the next series. Take care and congratulations that you're already ahead of us by doing the dietary changes that I've recommended before. But now you'll understand how it's helping you even more. Take it to the next level. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.